Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Thank you so much, Pastor Dan, for that powerful prayer session. Um, once again, let me welcome each and every one of you to tonight's service. Like you had, um, because of the present condition of the country, especially today, the 1st of August, um, we've decided to exercise an abundance of caution not to put or jeopardize anyone's safety. And um, that's why we're having this purely online cloud service. So you're welcome once again. And I trust God that as we have prayed and lifted up our voices to the ears of God, he will do so and much more for us in Jesus' name. According to Numbers 14, 28, it says, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do. That will be our testimony concerning our nation in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if any more member of your company is not there, make sure you get them to join. Because we are going to be examining something very crucial and very important, a message which you will take beyond just yourself, beyond your household, into your offices, your marketplaces, and also into the ears of those in governance, because it is very, very needful. So tonight, by the grace of God, I would like us to open to the book of Psalms, Psalm 72, Psalm 72, it's all about the entire passage, but I will just read verses 1 to 8 for today because of our precious time, just to give us an overview. Hallelujah. Psalm 72, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, and the topic of our discussion tonight is a very potent one, and I will tell you in a minute. Psalm 72, verses 1 to 8. It's a psalm of Solomon. Give your love of justice to the king, O God, and righteousness to the king's son. Help him judge your people in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. May the mountains yield prosperity for all, and may the hills be fruitful. Let me hear your amen in the chat box in Jesus' name. Help him to defend the poor, talking of the king, to rescue the children of the needy, and to crush their oppressors, and not to crush the oppressed. God will help our leaders to crush our oppressors, and he himself will come down to crush our oppressors and not our leaders oppressing us in the name of Jesus. Verse 5, may they fear you as long as the sun shines, as long as the moon remains in the sky, yes, forever. May the Lord instill the fear of God even in the hearts of our leaders in the name of Jesus. Verse 6, May the king's rule be refreshing, like spring rain on freshly cut grass. Hallelujah. That's God's plan and purpose for our leaders. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. The land is groaning. There is pain. There is hunger in the land. But according to the scripture, it's because the wicked are ruling. May the king's rule be refreshing like spring rain on freshly cut grass, like the showers that water the earth. May all the godly flourish during his reign. Hallelujah. I decree flourishing, consolidation on every side, even for all the godly in the name of Jesus. May there be abundant prosperity until the moon is no more. And in other words, for as long as the moon remains in the sky, there will be abundant prosperity, even in our land, in the name of Jesus. May it rain from sea to sea, 
and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. Verse 9, let me read verse 9. I think it's important for this first time. Let me read all the scriptures. Desert nomads will bow before him. His enemies will fall before him in the dust. The western kings of Tashish and other distant lands will bring him tribute. These are benefits when kings and those in leadership begin to rule according to the dictates of God. The eastern kings of Sheba and Seba will bring him gifts. All kings will bow before him and all nations will serve him. Instead of us becoming a pariah of nations, when God finishes with us and a righteous ruler or those in leadership begin to rule righteously, nations will begin to respect us. of what the network is doing to us. Good. Hallelujah. So, um, we've read the text. The topic under consideration of tonight, which by the grace of God, today being the 1st of August, and by the way, happy new month to all of you, it's a very jamming topic, which I've titled The God Factor in Governance. The God Factor in Governance. Because of the present situation, we have found ourselves. Like we had during the prayers, a national day of protest against bad governance is taking place or started today all over the country. It's been relatively peaceful in Abuja, we had in the city of Kano that the gatehouse of a government agency was burnt down. In Jos, I saw in the news that the protest was relatively peaceful. In Gombe, there was a massive turnout. It was relatively peaceful. The reports are still coming in from other cities. And like we have prayed, God himself will hijack it even for his glory in the name of Jesus. And we trust that the hoodlums will not take advantage to cause unnecessary deaths and to cause untold hardship on Nigerians in the name of Jesus. The psalm that we have read describes what the reign of a leader should be. And there are four things that are majorly highlighted there. The first one is that the reign of a leader should be righteous. In other words, should be moral and should be just. You see that in verse 1. The second thing that God expects the reign of a leader to be is to be beneficent. In other words, to be useful. To be useful to the poor, useful to the rich, useful to families, helpful to families and individuals. And of course, the overall help for the nation. You see that in verses 2 to 7 and verses 12 to 14. The third thing that this psalm tells us is that the rule or the leadership of a righteous leader should be universal. In other words, at home, in business, in government, in our careers, verses 8 to 11, from C to C, the Bible says. So a righteous leader's rule is expected to be righteous, is expected to be useful or helpful, beneficent, Thirdly, it's meant to be universal. In other words, not just at home, but in our businesses, righteous, godly leadership should manifest in our government, in our careers, in our schools. And lastly, a righteous leader's rule should be perpetual. In other words, it should be long-lasting. It should be unending. 
We see that in verses 15 and 17. So therefore, a president may be appointed for a term of four years or a governor appointed for the term of four years. But God expects that the people will keep referring to that tenure of that leader long after he or she may have gone. That's what it means by being perpetual. Hallelujah. As an MD of a multinational or a CEO of a multinational or a bank, you may, be, you may just be permitted by statute to serve for only 10 years, two terms of five, five years each, as we see legislated by the central bank for our corporate cowboys overseeing the banks. But God's intention is that though you may spend not more than 10 years, but your deeds and achievements ought to last forever. And I pray that every leader and those in authority will understand God's mind and intention for those in leadership. In Jesus' name, amen. In these days of economic turmoil, serious inflation, when the entire world is in a crisis mode, we know that our country, Nigeria, is not exempted. More so, ours has been compounded by bad leadership over the many years. And that is what has informed the title of this message as the God factor in governance. In other words, is there a way out? What is God's plan? How does God expect leadership or governance to be? What is the expectation of, leader, of governance or leadership? What we need across every strata of our country is leadership. A leadership that understands God's standard for rulership, which is justice and righteousness. A leadership that is divinely empowered to do what is morally right. What is morally right? I was in Lagos on Monday, and I was supposed to come in on Tuesday, uh, but we learned that the government or the Minister of Aviation grounded all the Arctic flights for maybe there was a court injunction or something. My flight was for 6.20 p.m. And I said, well, you know what, well, let me just go to the airport around three and relax and stay in the lounge and just wait for my flight. Not knowing that the Holy Spirit was directing me. Normally, my hotel is just about five, 10 minutes away from the airport. I will stay in the hotel till it's about 30 or 45 minutes because I will usually check in. And as I got there, they said, oh, sir, we've sent a text to you. The flight has been canceled, blah, blah, blah. I said, really? From that 3 p.m. till past six, almost to seven, I was looking for another flight. I couldn't get. I had to go back to my hotel. In other words, was that that's leadership. Many people have bought tickets. Whatever it was, you could give a day notice and say, well, from tomorrow or from two days' time, we are going to ground all our flights. And they will have onboarded, informed all their passengers. That's an example of poor leadership. So what is needed across every strata of our country today is righteous leadership. A leadership with the personal qualities or characters of being just of being impartial, of being fair, of being understanding. A leadership that conforms to the principle or ideals of righteousness. That is what is needed. A leadership that has the institutional capacity to administer what is just. In other words, a government that will demonstrate impartiality in the settlement of conflicting claims. Is it the hardest farmers clashes? You need a government that will demonstrate impartiality in the settlement of such issues and disputes. We need a leadership with that demonstrated institutional capacity to be able to punish those who are doing wrong and reward those who are doing well. And not a government that will be parochial, not a government that will reign in injustice. What is needed in this season and in these times? It's a leadership or a government with the institutional capacity for the establishment and determination of citizens' rights according to the rules of law and equity based on facts, figures, and accurate data. Not one that is using wishy-washy, sentimental, or ethnic rules of thumb that cannot withstand simple accountability tests. That is what is needed. That is the demand of this season a genuine response of responsible leadership, righteous leadership, a leadership that is powered by God and is ready to rule according to the ideals of God's standard. That is the motivation for this series. 
And by the grace of God, we'll continue this series for the next one month or two as the Lord will allow us. And that's why I said to you, you must get this message out because this is the heart of the problem at this point in our national life. Yes, it has been touted, oh, all over the world there are challenges. Yes, there are. But with an accurate leadership, then the right solutions will be put in place that will be able to calm the nerves and bring down the economic tempo, economic temperature, political temperature that is at the highest at this point in time and stabilize the nation so that we can all calmly listen to good leadership that will point us in the right direction. And I'm praying that the Lord himself will hijack this season out of the hands of our leaders and establish himself in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So when we look at the Psalms, so that is the motivation for this series. So now let's go back to Psalm 72 and let's see what God has to say. So the first thing to note in this Psalm, the Bible says, give your love of justice to the king, O God and righteousness to the king's son. Give your love of justice to the king. In other words, justice and righteousness are God's gifts to his chosen leader. They are God's gifts. They are the gifts of God to a chosen leader. You can't do it by yourself. God is the ultimate authentic leader. And is the one that gives the gifts of leadership, to, of justice and righteousness to those he has chosen to lead. So if you find yourself there by default, if you find yourself there sponsored by men, if you find yourself by under tactics hands, if you find yourself there by the Emilocon capacity or Emilocon slogan, or whatever ways you find yourself, you must seek this gift of justice and righteousness, this gift of leadership from the Lord. That is what God expects. That is God's expectation. That is what God wants. That is his desire. He's the only one that gives it. He's the ultimate authentic leader. And anyone that is ruling and reigning must be prepared to receive those gifts from him. Hallelujah. So when you see a leader who demonstrates the capacity for justice and righteousness, it is an indication of a leader that has been called to the throne of position by God and not one who has so promoted himself or is sponsored by men to be one. Hallelujah. No wonder that was the only gift Solomon requested of the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 3. In 1 Kings chapter 3. Quickly go there with me. 1 Kings chapter 3, you can open your Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 3, I will read verses 4 to 5 and I will read 9 to 14. Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. And at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask, what shall I give you? Verse 7. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I'm a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. I, I wish all our leaders would recognize that they are children before God. He says, I'm a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Whether you are a grandfather, whether you are a great-grandfather, before the father of all spirit, you are still a child. Solomon said, I'm a little child. I don't know how to go out or come in. Verse 8, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. A leader must recognize that you are there to serve the people. And the highest office in the land is the office of the citizen. You as Mr. President, your position is not higher than that of the citizen. You are there as the chief servant. You are there as the chief representative. The people, you must see the people as being great. You are just their servants. Your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people. He saw himself as a servant to the people. And I'm praying that our leaders will see themselves as God's servants to serve the people. Hallelujah. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, 
The great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. Verse 9. Therefore, give to your servants. Give to your servant. It's a gift which you must seek from the Lord if you are a leader. Not seeking from Marabouts. Not seeking from Babalawos. Not seeking from Habalis. No. It's a gift. Leadership is a gift which you must seek from the Father of all spirits, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Therefore, give to your servants an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge these great people of yours? No man can do it by himself. It's a gift from the Lord. Justice and righteousness, they are gifts from the Lord. Verse 10, and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise an understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall any like you arise after you. Hallelujah. And I'm saying to everyone in one leadership position or the other, you're in leadership in the local church, at the local church level, you're in leadership in your home, you're in leadership in your school, in your office, you're in leadership of a unit, or you're leading just a two-man squad, or you're at the MD or CEO, you've got to ask for the gift of leadership, that God will give you a wise and an understanding heart, and that you will recognize that you are a servant of, the, of God to lead or to serve the people, and that God will give you that grace and gift of wisdom and an understanding heart in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. When God finished with Solomon in verse 13, he said, and I've also given you what you have not asked for. Hallelujah. Wow. Amen. But riches and honor. What are you asking God for? Are you asking him for the grace to be able to lead that company aright? Are you asking for grace to be able to function effectively as a governor? Are you asking for grace to be able to govern the bank that you are the MD or the organization or the MDA that you are the chief executive, that you are the director general? Are you asking for wisdom to serve as a minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria? Are you asking for the wisdom and an understanding heart to serve as a commissioner in your state? Are you asking for that gift to serve as a legislator in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, as a Senate, distinguished Senate, I hope you are distinguished, or as a honorable member of the House? Are you asking for the gift of wisdom and understanding heart? That's the right thing to ask for. Verse 13. And I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor. Hallelujah. No man, God is never a taskmaster. He will never allow you to serve him without rewards. But don't put the cart before the horse. The horse must be before the cart. The horse is your servant. God's servant to serve the people in that area of leadership he has put you. Go there with the mindset of service. Ask for the gift of leadership the gift of wisdom and an understanding heart to be able to lead a right. And God will not only give it to you, but he will give you what you have not asked for, riches and honor, so that you will no one will be like you among all the leaders who have ever served before you. May that be your portion in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So I've also Amen. given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So, verse 14, if you walk in all my ways to keep my statutes and my commandment as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Hallelujah. You will not just serve for five years or ten, four years or eight years or five years and ten years, but God says he will give you, give you long life to be able to enjoy whatever riches and honor he gives you out of that position in the name of Jesus. Why do we see people who leave service? God knows and God sees my heart. I do not mock them. You finish serving in a position and two years after you are gone. Of what benefit? No time to rest and enjoy the riches and honor that God has given you? That's not God. When you finish your service wherever he has put you, 
He says, I will lengthen your days so that you can enjoy the labors, the fruit of your labors where you have served effectively and well. That is God's plan and purpose. And I pray that that will be your portion, that leader, whether at home, that leader in the office, that leader in the ministry, or as a minister, or whatever position of leadership you are occupying, may that be your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So we see, that's the first thing that I would like you to see, that God, the gifts of leadership, the gift of justice and righteousness, they are God's gifts to his chosen leader. Hallelujah. In the book of Romans, chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verses 9 to 12, we also see a particular scripture. What then are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. Nobody understands. Nobody is righteous. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Hallelujah. In other words, both righteousness and justice, they are God-given abilities. We must desire them and ask God for them in prayers. We have become, or he has made us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are only righteous in Christ. He sees us through the prism of Christ that we have, and in Christ, he has made us his righteousness and justice. There is divine abilities. And may they be your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Number two, the second thing I would like us to note from this passage is in verse number two, Psalm 71. It says, help him judge your people in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. It says, help the king to judge your people in the right way. Hallelujah. Help Amen. him to judge your people in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. To treat the poor fairly, whether in your little office of 10 staff or in your multiple office, multi-corporate office of 1,000 staff, or in your state of millions of people, or in the country of 220 million people, to be able to treat the poor fairly, you need the help of God. It says, help him to judge your people in the right way. It is not something to be taken for granted. Oh, don't you know what we did in Lagos? What did you do in Lagos? Lagos, no be Nigeria. And even in Lagos, it says, help him to judge your people in the right way. You can't come to God and boast about your works. What do you have that you have not received? If you did it well, it's because God empowered and enabled you to do it well. And your legacy speaks for you in the name of Jesus. It's not Amen. about blowing your own trumpet. It says, help him to judge your people in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. The ability to treat the poor fairly, the ability to listen to the cry of the poor, the ability to judge the people in the right way is a help that must come from the Lord. And that's why this topic is so jamming the God factor in governance. It's not based on your past experience. It's not based on the fact that, oh, see what I have done here. See what I have done here. No! It's God that will help you to judge in the right way. It's God that will help you to treat the poor fairly. Hallelujah. And that's why we are talking about the God factor in governance. Number two, what is it from this passage, from this verse number two? In other words, justice and righteousness, they are the leader's instruments for ruling and reigning and maintaining a just and an equitable society under God. I'll take that again. Justice and righteousness, they are the leader's instruments for ruling and reigning and governing and maintaining a just and an equitable society under God. Psalm 71, verse 2. New Living Translation. Help him to judge your people in the right way and let the poor always be treated fairly. In the book of Proverbs, it highlights this point very potently. Proverbs 29, verse 4. It says, The king establishes the land by justice. 
but he who receives bribes overthrows it. You cannot come to a place of leadership with the mindset of enriching yourself and you will think the land will be established. It will never happen. This is the word of the Lord. It says the king establishes the land by justice. You must come there with the mindset of Solomon. Lord, I'm not able to judge this, your people. I can't do it. Help me. And then when he gives you the gift of justice and righteousness, then you'll be able to do it. it says the king establishes the land by justice. It will take justice. It will take fairness. It will take righteousness. It will take standing by the side of right to be able to establish any land. But not one who receives bribes. You will only cause katakata. But he who receives bribes overthrows it. Destabilizes the land. Hallelujah. In verse 14 of the same Proverbs 29, verse 14, it says, if a king faithfully judges the poor, his throne will be established forever. Leader, faithfully, judges and treats the poor. Give them their rights. Give them their benefit. Give them their due. His throne will be established forever. It does not mean you will rule forever. It means you will serve your time and live, but your legacy will remain forever. I'm talking about the God factor in governance. The king faithfully judges the poor. His throne will be established forever. That's the word of God. Faithfully judges the poor. Hallelujah. And in verse 26 of the same Proverbs 29, Proverbs 29, 26, it says, many seek the face of a ruler, but it is from the Lord that a man gets justice. You can entreat the favor of a ruler. You can seek the face of a ruler. You can curry favor of men. You can, you can lick their dust. But you know what? It's only from the Lord that a man can get justice. And what does that imply? It's only through a man that has submitted himself to the lordship of our Lord Jesus and has embraced the gift of justice that is able to give or met out justice to their people. Not those who feel they, are, they know more than God, or because those who are leaning on their past experience. Hallelujah. King David, the son of Jesse, the man that was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, he declared as the Holy Spirit spoke to him in his last words in 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel 23, verse 3. He says, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me, he who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Hallelujah. This was a man that was a judge by the man that was after the heart of God. It says, God of Israel said to me, the rock of Israel spoke to me, the Holy Spirit ministered to him, that he who rules over men must be just. See that word just, justice. Ruling in the fear of God. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. In Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 32 verse 1, Behold, Isaiah 32 verse 1, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. You see those two words, justice and righteousness. The king will reign in righteousness and princes, ministers, justices, national assembly members, MDs and CEOs, and various leaders, corporate board directors, says princes, they will rule with justice. That is God's pattern. The gift of leadership is justice and righteousness. Hallelujah. In other words, if anyone will rule and reign and maintain a just and an equitable society under God, you need this instrument of justice. You need this instrument of righteousness. In Ezekiel 45, Ezekiel 45, verses 9 and 10, the subheading is laws governing the prince. The prince there is start standing for, is depicting leaders, those in leadership. We have the king, who is the overall leader. Then you have the princes, his associates, ministers, commissioners, and what have you. First says the Lord God, verse 9, Enough, O princes of Israel, 
remove violence and plundering, execute justice and righteousness, and stop dispossessing my people, says the Lord God. You should have, you should have honest skills, an honest effort, and an honest bath. <laughs> Hallelujah. It says, execute justice and righteousness. Remove violence and plundering. A leader that will rule, a leader that will reign, that must be just, that must rule in the fear of God, will ensure that there is no violence or plundering of his people. It says, enough, O princes of Israel. Remove anything that will cause violence or plundering. Execute justice and righteousness and stop dispossessing my people, says the Lord God. The message of those verses says, Ezekiel 45, verses 9 and 10 from the message. I've put up with you long enough, princes of Israel. Quit bullying and taking advantage of my people. Do what is just and right for a change. Do it for a change. Use honest skills, honest wits, and honest measures. I pray that our leaders who are hearing me as we speak, leaders in various strata of leadership, we heed this counsel of the Lord. They will quit bullying and taking advantage of the people they are called to lead, and they will do what is just and right for a change in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that they will use honest skills, honest ways, and honest measures in the mighty name of Jesus. In terms Amen. of corporate employment, in terms of corporate employment, you will not just pack people from a particular zone to fill up the place. That's not honest skills without federal character, without the character floods the place with these people. That's not honest skills. And God is not pleased with it. He's quit bullying and taking advantage of my people. He says he has put up long enough with all these our shenanigans. And I'm praying that we intervene. And as we have prayed and as we will still pray, that the Lord said we hijack the leadership of our country in the name of Jesus. Man. Friends, what are we saying? Righteousness is the first virtue of government. And the king or the leader or those in governance, they are the main guardian of justice and the protector of the poor. That is why you are there to lead, not to stuff your pockets. If you go there with an understanding heart that you have sought from the Lord, he says he will give you what you have not asked for, honor and riches. But that's not the main thing. You are not going there for that. You are going there to be able to serve, to be God's servant, to minister and administer justice and righteousness and fairness and equity to those you have been called to lead. But in addition, it says, it will give you honor and riches. And if you obey statutes, it will also give you a long life, long after you have left the place, to be able to enjoy the fruit of your labors in the name of Jesus. Friends, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters in the Lord, and all those who are hearing me tonight, I want to recommend for all those in leadership, the book of Jeremiah chapter 22, to go and sit down with it and study it because it's one of the manuals for leadership. And I will take you through a few of the verses. Jeremiah chapter 22, we'll read verses one to five and then we we'll jump to verses 11 to 19. But I recommend this for all those in leadership. Leadership at home, leading your family, leadership in your school, whether you're a headmaster or you're a principal, leadership in your careers and your marketplaces as a businessman or businesswoman or entrepreneur or agripreneur or techpreneur, whatever preneur is your own field. This is a manual for you to study what leadership or God's mind of leadership is about. Jeremiah 22 verses 1 to 5. 